Monster is an amazing series, with a lot of flashbacks and piecing together of different histories into one full story. This video is going to be a catalogue of Johan's life chronologically, from his birth to the end of his recorded actions. There are gaps in what we know about Johan's life, so there will be some missing time here and there, but everything that we do know is included here. There's also a lot of different characters in this series, and some only pop up for a little while, so we'll keep photos or videos on screen to remind you of who's who. Likewise, we'll be keeping a timeline going to show where we are chronologically. Finally, German and Czech names? Um, I'm coming from the manga and the sub, so apologies in advance for the pronunciations. Let's crack in. The story begins in 1975, with a not-so-chance encounter between two people, Johann's mother and father. These two have been pushed together by psychiatrist-psychologist Franz Bonaparte as part of a eugenics experiment designed to create a new leader of humanity. The resulting pairing results in double the results with twins Johan and Anna. Note that we're going to be calling her Anna instead of Nina through this whole video. Before their birth, the parents attempted escape before being recaptured and the father killed. The remaining family, now essentially prisoners to the experiment, moved to the Three Frogs building, which became their first home. By 1981, the now five-year-old twins dressed the same to give the illusion that only one child existed to the people around them. Their lives are still held in Bonaparte's experiments. The defining experiment came when the mother is forced to give away one of her children to the Red Rose Mansion. While both children are dressed the same, it's unclear if the mother can tell them apart, but she picks Johan before changing her mind and sending Anna. The mother and Anna leave to the Red Rose Mansion. Anna is subjected to days locked in a dark closet before finally being released into a room which is filled with people related to the experiment. She witnesses Bonaparte poison and kill all the people in the room besides themselves, then he tells her to run. She runs back to the Three Frogs to find Johan there still alone. He had presumably been rereading Bonaparte's book The Nameless Monster for the past few days, waiting for her to return. As Anna tells the tale of what happened to her, Johan internalizes the memories and believes that he himself was the one that was sent to the mansion and witnessed the mass murder, with Anna waiting for him to return. At this point, the kids are alone, with the mother disappeared and the experimenters dead. With no reason to stay, the twins set the three frogs ablaze and set off into the world without any destination in mind. During this time, they were taken in by a few different families. Johan definitely killed the first adopted parents, and most likely killed all the others as well, without Anna's knowledge. By 1982, the two six-year-olds have wandered out to the Czech-German border. Here, a patrol officer, later known as General Wolf, finds them on the brink of exhaustion. Seeing the nameless monster in Johan's hand, he decides to name the boy Johan. Johan was such a nice name, after all. Wolf then sends the kids on to two separate orphanages in East Germany, Anna to Orphanage 47 and Johan to the questionable Kinderheim 511. The latter is an experimental facility set up by the East German government in order to turn children into super soldiers, brainwashing and stripping kids of humanity. However, Johan came to this facility already a monster. If Bonaparte had made a monster of Johan, Kinderheim was taking his humanity out. Johann stayed in Kinderheim three years until 1985. It was then that Johann incites the massacre inside Kinderheim, where nearly all of the staff and children tear each other apart, Johann watching the whole thing from atop a staircase. Kinderheim burns down, and only Johann and a few others make it out. Burning things down will become common for Johann as his journey continues. At some point shortly post-Kinderheim, he is adopted by the Liebitz. He pushes them to adopt Anna also, and so a sort of family is formed. In 1986, the family flee from east to west Germany into Dusseldorf. This is where the series begins following the events directly. Shortly after arriving, Bonaparte, who is living at Dusseldorf at the time, visits the family to see how the kids are doing. He checks in on the children while they are asleep, but unknown to the others, Johann was not sleeping. Sometime after Bonaparte leaves, Johann takes a gun and shoots both of his adopted parents. When Anna enters the room shocked, Johann hands her the gun and tells her to shoot him in the head. Johan is rushed to Isla Memorial Hospital, having survived the headshot, but barely. His surgeon, Dr. Kenzo Tenma, performs emergency surgery and manages to save Johan's life. One day during recovery, Tenma laments to the only pretending unconscious Johan about selected members of his hospital. Johan, to repay Tenma's surgery work, kills those mentioned members via poisoned candies. Shortly after, he takes Anna and disappears from the hospital altogether. From the hospital, the twins live with Reinhard Dinger, a taxi driver shortly to be turned killer by Johan. 
This home is short-lived before the twins move on. Their next stop is the Fortners, where Johan leaves his still recovering sister. He plans to reunite with her on their 20th birthday. Johan continues to travel and bounce from parents to parents. From Heidelberg to Munich to Köln, where he stays in school for a time actually. Before he moves on again, he burns that school he attended, removing evidence of his own time there. His next stop was another family in Hanover, then a couple in Hamburg for a time, before settling with another family by the name Liebert. These Liebets had a son around Johann's age, also named Johann. This other Johann had died, though records of that death were mysteriously burned. During his time with these Liebets, Johann took over the role of that son. This is also when Johann begins his underworld money laundering business, quickly becoming the underworld's primary way of cleaning dirty money, dealing in the degree of millions of dollars. Johann is still only about 14 or 15 years old at this point as well. For the most part, Johann did not spend much time with the Liebets, mainly using them as a backup for his current identity. It's also most likely during this time that he came into contact with and recruited Roberto, also known as Adolf Reinhardt. Three years later, Johann hires Adolf Junker's crew to carry out some of the murders of his previous adopted parents, continuing the middle-aged couple murders. By 1995, Johann has moved on to another family, the Springers, and stays with them for about a year. He looks to clean house by killing off Junker's crew, but Junker's himself escapes, only to end up being treated by Dr. Tenma. Johan manages to draw Junkers out, but Tenma arrives in hot pursuit. The three men meet in a nearby parking building where Johan executes Junkers in front of Tenma before walking away, thus setting in motion Johan's biggest antagonist, Dr. Tenma. This year marks Johann's 20th birthday and his promise to reunite with Anna. He sends her letters to meet him at Heidelberg Castle, though we don't know for sure what his intentions are. He posts a man at the castle to keep Anna there, meanwhile he's purchased two corrupt cops to go and kill off her adopted parents, the Fortners. While Tenma manages to stop him from meeting Anna, the Fortners are still killed by the cops, also including Jacob Mora, an editor of the Heidelberg Post who got dragged into this whole mess. Johan attempts to meet Anna again in the following year in 96. At this time, Johan has just disappeared from the underground money business he was running, and the underworld has gone into chaos over who gets the money. Concurrently, a neo-Nazi group led by the baby have been vying for Johan's attention to become their next Hitler. While Johan has no interest in this group, he does drop by to leave a message for Anna to meet him at Heidelberg and Engel's warehouse. It's also at some point during this time, and possibly in the year previous, that he's been cutting off all of the people that surround General Wolf. With the baby and Tenma chasing Johan's attention, when Anna arrives at the location, he isn't there. Instead, having written over the water tower, Help! The monster inside me is about to explode. The following year, in 97, Johann enrolls in the University of Munich, majoring in children's law and volunteering with local children. This university is also the one Anna is attending. During this time, and presumably through the latter of 96, Johann has also been working to isolate Hans Schuwald, one of the biggest economic players in Europe. By 97, he has isolated Schuwald from most of his relationships, making him more and more reliant on the young prodigy that is Johann. Johann has also spent time grooming Edmund Farron, a fellow university goer, to pose as Schuwald's son. However, the situation changes when Johann meets his real son, Carl Newman. Johann changes strategy, coaxing Edmund into suicide or possibly killing him and setting up Carl as a legitimate heir. By bringing Schuwald his true son, Johann has fully cemented himself at Schuwald's side. At the same time, Detective Richard Brown has been putting the pieces together over Edmund's suicide, leading him towards Johan. Before all of those pieces can fall into place, Johan meets with Richard and begins to subtly psychologically attack him, bringing up his past failures as a cop and trying to push him back into alcoholism. This ultimately fails, and Johan kills him by pushing him off the roof, staging the whole event as a suicide from Richard's supposed fall back into alcohol. Also during this time at university, Johan has been teaching a group of kids the rooftop game. You climb to the roof, close your eyes, and walk forward. If fate favours you, you will live and see the world in a new light. This leads to a number of children dying, though Johan manages to stay unnoticed in all of these events. 
After all of this, Johan comes into contact with another copy of The Nameless Monster by Franz Bonaparte for the first time since childhood. This triggers a psychological reaction from Johan, causing a major, if subtle, change. Soon after, at the opening of Schuwald's book donation, Johan causes the library to burn down, narrowly avoiding assassination from Tenma and escaping once again. After the library incident, Johan moves back to the Czech Republic, to Prague. There he disguises himself as his sister Anna and sets up a life for himself. He's here investigating his own history, killing the previous headmaster of Kinderheim 511 who lives here, Reinhard Biermann. There is also a recording of himself as a child during an interview held at Kinderheim. That's Johan's next goal. In his pursuit, he kills several policemen who are also searching for the tape, all the while still dressed as Anna. At some point, he gets his hands on the tape and records a message for Tenma over the end of it, coaxing Tenma to follow him on this wild chase. It's during this time in Prague that he manipulates Milos, one of Beerman's adopted children, into fleeing to the Red Light District, and suggests that the young boy kill himself if he can't find his mother. Johann also orchestrates three murders to aid Christoph Lastname, a fellow survivor of Johann's Kinderheim history and colloquially known as the Devil's Apprentice. Before finally leaving Prague himself, Johann sets fire to the Red Rose Mansion. Following Prague, Johann returns to Germany and reunites with Christoph under the aid of Eva Heinemann, Tenma's ex fiance After connecting with Christoph, Johann tracks down Peter Chapik, Franz Bonaparte's old right-hand man. Chapik can't give him Bonaparte's location, but leads him to his son, Jaromir Lipsky, the puppeteer. Before leaving to find Jaromir, Johann meets Anna once again. This is when he learns that he was never the one that went to the Red Rose Mansion all those years ago, a fact that makes him smile and tear up. Leaving Anna there, Johann tracks down the puppeteer and learns where the man himself is hiding these days, the village of Ruenheim. Before heading there, Johann starts his final house clean. He personally kills his last remaining subordinate, Horst Grossman, then organizes the murder of all of the serial killers he has manipulated over the past years, cutting off all his ties before heading to the perfect suicide. Johann travels to Ruenheim with Roberto and begins slyly distributing guns and preying upon the fears of the small town. This starts a fire that ignites into a blaze which begins yet another massacre for this town. As the town reaches its height of chaos, Johann meets Tenma at the center, ready to die by his hands. Tenma has followed Johann and is poised to end it all, but he won't take the shot. Johann threatens the young Wim to pressure Tenma to take it, but Tenma's still not shooting. Then, ultimately, he is shot by the boy's father, ending his journey and his perfect suicide. Or so he thought. Tenma gives emergency surgery to Johan, saving his life from a bullet to the head a second time. Johan remains unconscious post-surgery until the epilogue in 1999. At some point in 99, Tenma has had time to track down Johan's mother and learn the twins' real names. When Tenma returns to Johan's hospital bed, he begins to talk about that mother and Johan's true name. We don't know if the name is spoken, but Johan immediately wakes up to Tenma and fills in the final piece of his history before falling seemingly unconscious once again. After Tenma leaves, Johan's bed is empty. Where Johan is now, no one knows. That's Johan's journey. There is some ambiguity in that ending around whether or not the final reveal to Tenma was all in his head, if Johan escaped the hospital or potentially died at the hospital. There is supposedly some more information in the somewhat sequel Another Monster, but admittedly I'm only about halfway through it. I think the ambiguous ending in this series is by design, so we're gonna leave it there. This is the end of the video. If you watched till here, thanks! Um, I really hope you enjoyed this. Less goofs than I normally try to put in, but I think that matches Monster's style a bit more, you know? If you like it, consider liking, subscribing, y'all know how this works. Leave me a comment, I love chatting with people. Um, oh, I got a Twitter now too, if you want to like have a good convo, hit me up. Always down for a yarn. If you're a Monster fan, uh, definitely go and read Billy Bat, seriously, you will love it so much. Anyways, thanks for watching. This has been CG, and I'll see you G's in the next one.